We begin our program today with the biblical passage that narrates the creation of the human being. We read in Genesis chapter 1 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, after our likeness, so they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move on the earth. God created humankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. The first question that arises is, how was man created? This will be told in the next chapter. Here you are told to, exert dominance. God gave him dominion over the earth, and I don't think that means that God made him some kind of illustrious gardener of the Garden of Eden. Adam was given great authority. A little later we will see that he was going to have to do certain things in relation to the creation that God had given him. Here we have simply the simple fact of the creation of man. This is the third time we encounter the Hebrew word, bara, which means to create out of nothing. So we take note that man is created, he is something new. It is the first word that had appeared in the first verse of Genesis, in that expression. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He created the physical universe. Then, he created life. It says here, and God created the great sea monsters, and every living thing that moves. As we read in this chapter 121, and now, in this biblical passage, we see that he created man. Verse 27 goes on to say, so God created man in his own image. God will give us the details about his creation of man in the next chapter, and we can see that he has omitted much about the creation of the universe. The phrase, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, contains all the information that he has left us and it is all that we can know on this subject. He could have included details, but he didn't. He did offer more details, only in relation to a fact of his creation, as in the case of the creation of man. And do you know why? Because this story was written for the human being. God wants him to know what his origin was. It is as if God were saying, I would really like you to pay attention to your own creation and not speculate about the creation of the universe. This verse that we have just read tells us something extraordinary. Consider the phrase, so God created man in his own image. I would like to suggest that you consider this one of the great statements of the word of God. I could not conceive of anything so wonderful as this fact. What does it mean? Well, I believe that man is similar to God, he is like a trinity. Of course someone will immediately reply that I mean that man is physically, mentally and spiritually one being. Well yes, I think that's true. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5 23, stated this very thing. Now may the God of peace himself make you completely holy and may your spirit and soul and body be kept entirely blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although this is true, when we get into the next chapter we will see that it actually involves more than that. I think it refers to the fact that man is a personality, and that being a personality, he is aware of himself and makes his own decisions. He is a morally free agent. This is apparently unique and exclusive to humans. I think this is what is meant by saying that God created man in his own image. Verse 27 adds the expression, male and female he created them. This sentence does not give us the details about how man and woman were created, details that we will not find out until we get to the second chapter. This is why I am of the opinion that God did not intend to provide us with the details about the creation of this magnificent universe in which we find ourselves. Otherwise, he would have left us another chapter devoted to this matter. He offers no other explanation beyond that he is the creator. This reminds us of that extremely important truth found in the epistle to the Hebrews, in chapter 11 to 3, which says the following, By faith we understand that the worlds were set in order at God's command, so that the visible has its origin in the invisible. What we see today was made of things that didn't even exist before. The creation was made from nothing. If someone asked for an explanation about it, he would answer that I can't give it. And evolution can't explain it either. Evolution has never answered the question of how nothing can become something. As we have already commented in previous programs, it always begins with a small amoeba, with the debris, with a seaweed or with animals. It seems as if our mind needs something concrete as a starting point, 
but the Bible starts with nothing. Therefore, the fact that God created is the extraordinary revelation of this chapter. We continue reading this first chapter, in verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that moves on the ground. Here we can see that God has given this creature something exceptional. First of all he says to man, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. And we will hear him repeat it when he creates the woman. God seems to be the one who introduced the theme of sex. It is really interesting to consider that our generation thinks it has made a discovery on this subject of sex. God already brought this matter up in the very beginning. Actually, there are four methods that God has used to introduce human beings into this universe. The first was by direct creation, in the case of Adam. A second way consisted of indirect creation, in the case of Eve. The third method was the virgin birth, through which Jesus Christ came into the human family. And the fourth, natural generation, quite well known today. Indeed, we have brought natural generation down to a level that was never present in God's intent. He created man to reproduce. This is a wonderful and splendid truth, which must not be turned into something bad and obscene, as the human being is doing today. Indecent books are being written, which are called literature. Works of that kind are being produced and are called art. Some critics are beginning to speak out against these abuses, for which we thank God. Such critics are saying what I have been arguing for a long time, that much of what is called art is disgusting and repulsive and does not deserve to be considered artistic work at all. It is nothing more than obscenity produced simply for substantial financial gain. God never intended for sex to be denigrated in this way. God created the human being in his image. God is the essentially personal being and by giving man an immortal soul, he also endowed him with a true personality. The human being is aware of himself, has the ability to choose freely and has a well-determined moral responsibility. He is created in the image and likeness of God. As we see in the command, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, God told the human being to populate the earth through reproduction. He notes that he uses the word, filled. This is an interesting word that seems to indicate that the earth had previously been inhabited by other creatures. Whatever such creatures may have been, they had disappeared when man was created. God commanded man to rule the earth. I believe that this is the basis for the knowledge and scientific exploration of our time. One of the biblical proverbs, specifically the one found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25 to 2, says the following, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. God hides diamonds deep in the earth, placing the treasures there, where man has to dig to discover them. I believe that today the same is true of knowledge. And it is also true with regard to the study of the Word of God. God wants us to go to the laboratory to use the test tube and the microscope, although unfortunately what man has discovered is a nuclear bomb and other means with which he would manage to destroy the human family of our time. Exercising dominion is part of God's instructions. Adam was not merely a gardener tasked with cutting the grass but he was created to rule the earth. I think Adam could control the weather in the same way that we control the air conditioning in our homes. He ruled this land. It is what we see in the Lord Jesus. When he was on earth, he exercised control over nature. He was able to tell the storm, calm down. He was able to feed the crowd with five loaves and two fish. In my opinion, Adam could have done all of this up to the time of his fall. In the fall, he lost the domain that God had given him. Let's continue with the reading of verse 29, which reads like this, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. From this statement, I deduce that man was originally a vegetarian and that he was not a carnivore until after the flood. And the biblical text continues in verses 30 and 31 of this first chapter, saying, And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. 31 And God saw everything that he had made, and, behold, it was very good. 
and there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. This paragraph leads us to the end of the chapter, so it would be convenient to make a summary here, highlighting some points. One of them is the fact that God is mentioned 32 times. The Bible makes no attempt to prove that there is a God. Because? It will be because in Psalm chapter 14.1, the inspired poet said, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. The Bible is a book written to reveal spiritual, religious, and redemptive truth, which comes to us only through faith. So in this passage we are presented with the reality that God is the one who created. In this first chapter, we can observe the unity and power of the personality of God. It is exactly what the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans chapter 1 verse 20, when he said the following, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divinity, have been clearly seen. And we ask ourselves how is it that they have become clearly visible? And the writer answers us, being understood by means of the created, so that they are without excuse. Considering these words, I can honestly tell you that God has left you no choice but to have faith in him. We should take note of other truths included in this chapter. Polytheism is rejected. One God, he is the one who creates. Second, the eternity of matter is denied. The first words were, in the beginning, and everything had a beginning. This is true despite the fact that there was a time when science taught the eternity of matter. Third, this chapter rejects pantheism. God is before all things and he exists apart from them. Fourth, fatalism is denied. God acts in the freedom of his will. Finally, let me list the notable features of chapter 1, which are 1. Order, 2. Progress, 3. Promptitude, and 4. Perfection. Thanks for watching.